three, two, one, and welcome back to the SBH podcast. And in this podcast, I have a guest, and it is my camera guy, and so. we're going to talk about the show and the really the amazing fishing we've had for the entirety of the full moon. Yeah. Um, and what we've the struggles that we've gone through with gear, really, pretty much just this moon phase. Yeah. It's been killing us. Um, but hey. It's part of the game, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think on top of that, we'll also sort of go through a more detailed explanation of sort of how we do what we do and as far as like video and pictures and stuff. Because um, I have yeah. all my, my equipment here that I use when we're out in the rocks. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll sort of, this might be one to, to watch if you like to listen to it for the most part, um, because we have some cool stuff here. And it might be cool to have a, have a visual to go along with the audio. Yeah. And um, yeah, because the... Really, this is going to be pretty much based out of, like, um, I get a lot of questions about, like, how I get the fo the photos that I get. Um, and it's not me, because <laughs> I can't do that. But, um, and really, if you want to get photos like I do, you need to be fishing with somebody. And you need to be fishing with somebody that knows what they're doing with the camera. Because a lot of the time, you know, we, we get good photos, but it's like, it, it comes at a cost. Yeah, and for that, sure. And it's not, it's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I guess we can sort of start with um, sort of talking about what's been going on recently with us and sort of um, what we've been dealing with as far as the fishing goes and as far as the filming as well. So Do we want to get started off with that? Yeah, I mean, let's start with the fishing, get people warmed up a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I mean, it's been really, really interesting this week. And obviously, as the fishing has progressed, and I've been saying it for for a long time, I was like, I haven't got a 40 pound fish yet. I really want to get a 40 pound fish. And the moon phase to do it is that first full moon in August. And it just always seems to be that moon phase that gets me that big fish. And uh, I knew it was going to happen just because there was a lot of big fish around. And we started it off with like, I don't know, five, six days before the moon phase. And we were starting to, we would, we we're, Pretty much since then, it's been every single night we've gotten at least one bass, forty plus inches every night, and um, it. W but it's been slow. It's one of those things that you get to a spot, you got to fish it, and you got to fish it hard, and you got to really, really wait for those fish to come stage up and then get your eel. It's not. Getting, it's not been a bite. It's not. I wouldn't call it like a bite, as in like you're getting multiple big fish in a row. But you're you're targeting that one monster bass, and it's been we've been fortunate enough to pull a forty pound bass this week, uh, on top of many twenty pound bass, a few high twenty pound bass, uh, and that's been really awesome. Um, but we I've been doing mostly eeling. I've tried some plugs. Plugs have not been working as well for me, but it's whatever. Uh, plugs tend to work better in the fall for me anyway. I, I use mostly plugs in the fall, but I really am trying to get those monster bass and I want to be, you know, the goal was to break 40 pounds and we did it earlier before even this big hurricane that's going to move through and make the fishing really good happened. And uh, I really wanted to do that and we got it early, early in the moon phase and this hurricane hasn't even showed up yet. And when you have a full moon, you have a hurricane and it all meets at one point, it's lights out fishing just because that super big low pressure on top of the astronomical high tides is just makes the fishing out of this world. Um, I've had nights in the fall where we had big storms come through. Uh, like I, there, I guess they're somewhat hurricane like storms, but um, I had nights with um, Joe from Puma Plugs where we had dozen fish over 40 inches and a few that were over 40 pounds and that's like we're hoping to get there later this week uh it should happen um but the bass have been feeding heavily in deep water you've got to search for those deep water you know rises from like super deep water to shallower water or to boulders and that's where the bass have been hanging uh because the water is really warm right now it's probably 72 73 degrees where we're fishing and um, that's warm for bigger fish and they don't tend to feed very aggressively at that point, but I kid you not, these fish are fighting so hard, like for their size, we've been having awesome fights. Like I, I caught a 40 inch bass the other, or yeah, it was a 40 inch bass the other night. This is before I hooked a 40 pound bass and I was fishing with my 200 van stall, uh, attached my GSB, Lamaglass GSB Skinner. Um, and 
uh, I had pretty tight drag on that. I probably had 18 pounds of drag on that fish and it took me for a run. I mean, it took a solid 30 yards of line out um, and just straight screaming line. Um, it was awesome. It was a really hard fight, but when I was fighting this fish, it, I felt it and it was like, man, this fish doesn't feel super heavy because when you're fishing, when you hook into a 40 pound fish, you're like, oh, you know, it doesn't move when you first hook into it. But this fish, I was moving a little bit, but it was just pulling so much drag. And um, we were fighting it and we were fighting it and it was screaming drag. And then I got it in and it was like, oh, it's a 40 inch bass. It's still 20 pounds, still an awesome fish. Any bass over 40 inches is still awesome. You can't complain with a 20 pound, 20 plus pound fish. But uh, yeah, they weren't, um, they weren't like huge and we wanted those monsters. That was what we were looking for. We were looking for those monster fish to get on film. Uh, and so we got into the wetsuit swimming game and we'd been swimming out to rocks and we were you know, covering a lot of ground. We were doing a lot of swimming and fishing all these boulders and trying to get to where these bigger fish are. And we, on a whim, went to one spot one day and yeah, it, it happened. We hooked a 40 inch bass, hook into this thing, doesn't move. I'm like, I told you, it's a monster. And I, and so what I do is I lock my drag down on my, my reel and for the hook setting, cause you don't want your drag to slip. Boom, my hook's into this fish. I loosen it down, two cranks, and that's still on a Vansol VSX 275, is still gonna be that um, heavy drag. It's gonna be in over 20 pounds of drag for sure. And that thing was peeling drag. Uh, and I'm, you, I don't know if you can see it on the video. I don't know if you've actually seen the video yet. I've seen the video, but, but yeah. I was leaning like, I'm kid you not. I was leaning all the way back into this fish. And if it yeah. broke, I would have fallen backwards. <laughs> like I had to do that or he was going to pull me in the water. That's how powerful that fish was. And we managed to land it in a short order. It didn't take, it didn't fight too long, but it pulled like 40 yards of drag. Like it, it was pulling line like crazy. And we landed it in probably under two minutes. Yeah, it was it was not a very like long fight as far as fights go, but it was um, intense. It was yeah, powerful fish. for sure. And I guess sort of like when you look at sort of the way that we normally handle these fish, it's like you'll catch it. I'll turn on my camera with the light and everything, and you turn on the GoPro because that's sort of one thing that we've been doing as far as um, for audio. We use a GoPro um, because it can deal with the conditions, and it's like right there, so it gets a pretty nice um, like audio of him talking and and the like drag going um yeah. screaming so that's that's cool to have like that component to it mm -hmm. but he'll land the fish we normally like bring it to some more calm water yeah um that you can sort of stand in um or swim in kind of swim but, in yeah and like i like to sort of get in the water with finn and the fish and sort of to get that like really in the action kind of stuff yeah um and that that's sort of something that we've that we figured out. We've got it down to almost a science. Um, and yeah. sometimes it, it really goes wrong, like it did the other night. Um, GoPro died. Yeah, flash like, broke. Yeah, so I, I guess all camera lens was fogging up. Yeah. So I guess we're gonna we're gonna go through sort of the gear that I use on an average night when we're out there fishing um, to keep my stuff safe and uh, to be able to take the pictures and take the video that we do. Um, and a lot of this stuff you guys haven't seen yet because most of the really big fish footage is coming up in, in future episodes of the show, namely the next episode of the show, which is coming out on the 15th of August. It's going to be stupid good. So um, we're sort of working on that, but I'm going to sort of explain how what my setup looks like when we're out there fishing at night mm -hmm. um, and like in the surf and me getting in the water to film with, with Finn and the fish. So the base of everything is the GH5, um, which is a great camera for what we're doing um, as far as like run and gun filmmaking and um, being able to sort of keep everything, um, it, it has a good internal stabilization and like a dual stabilization with the lens. Um, and so then on top of that, I'm putting this, which um, is a remote flash trigger that I took apart. Um, and you'll see why I took it apart in just a second. Um, so this slides right into the hot shoe. Um, and basically what it does is when I take a picture, this sends out a signal um, that then a receiver can use to trigger the flash. So, um, so I have that, and then I have this, which has been a godsend for us. Yeah. Um, this is an underwater housing for the camera um, that is perfect 
in terms of like keeping it dry. It's rated for diving, although I don't know how much I would trust it um, to dive with it. But it is uh, it does a job for sure for what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and it makes sure that I'm not getting any water in my camera. And so the camera will slide in there. And the reason why I had to take apart um, that uh, trigger is so that it will fit right in the top of this housing. So then when this is closed in, there's no water that's gonna get into the camera. And so I can bring this thing underwater um, and I can take some underwater footage, which we've been doing, which has been crazy. And, and that you've sort of seen at the end of, um, of episode two with that underwater footage of the fish that was entirely by virtue of, of having one of these. Yeah. Um, and so then onto the side of that, I add this light, which I have in two plastic bags to keep it dry. And it's still like, we've had some issues with it. Um, like, I'm not sure how much of this you'll be able to see. Actually, you can't see it at all. So <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Um, but like half of the LEDs are out on this, um, just because it's gotten wet and it's been like in the water. Um, so that's sort of another thing we've been dealing with is, um, it's difficult to keep all the gear dry, uh, because there's not a lot of people that are doing what we're doing as far as being in the water and, um, like in completely in the elements. Yeah. So things like the, a flash, um, aren't going to be like weather sealed for the most part. And if you are getting like a diving flash, then that's a whole nother level of expense because it's such a specialized yeah. piece of equipment. But let's just break it down for everyone because you know, yeah, let's just break it down for everyone. <laughs> And all the one stuff of those flashes, yeah. one of those flashes is what, 180 bucks, something no, like no, that. No, no, one of the flashes is, is 80 bucks flat. Oh, it's 80 bucks. Okay. So it's not that bad. So it's actually not too bad. I thought it was worse. Um, and uh, then the light is what, 30 bucks? Yeah, this is like a 35 dollar light from Amazon. And everything, all the gear is in the description if you want to like take a look at what it is. Yeah. Um, and so the like the lights are sold separately from the batteries, but um, it's not like as far as so. With the flash, the flash is like $84. The light like this is $35. Um, and versus like a diving light with like a flash on it or something like that would be like closer to the like $700 range, yeah. which is incredibly expensive. And it makes sense just because it's such a specialized piece of equipment. And that's the thing I was talking about this. Well, to, I don't know if to you or other people, but like um, the, the stuff that we're getting, it's like getting a van stall versus like a pen battle. Um, we're getting like the pen battle for what we're doing, mm -hmm. which still works and it's very solid and functions well versus dropping, you know, 700 to a thousand dollars on a fully sealed reel. That's not going to break. And then what I always justify buying van stalls for is if you break a flash like that, which we've only done once this whole season. Mm -hmm. So if we broke it more then it would be more justifiable to buy a $700 light, mm -hmm. but, uh, light slash flash, but, um, yeah, so we haven't done it, broken it enough to the point that I'm like, we need to get another one. Mm -hmm. If we end up doing a second season of this, depending on how much people end up enjoying this, mm -hmm. uh, then we probably will end up buying a dive light. Yeah, um, and at that point, that. like, if we're doing... Because we want to get some more stuff. Yeah. And the tough part about this season is, like, we coronavirus has helped us like be able to have us be able to film the entirety of the season, mm -hmm. but it's hurt us in the fact that we were planning on doing collabs with people. Um, and we can't anymore because like a lot of the people that we wanted to collab with are, you know, from New York, New Jersey and Maine and whatever. So it was like one of those things that like I wanted to go collab with some people around, but, uh, I wasn't able to do it. So I was only collabing really with like local people, people that are in my area. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just unfortunate, but it happens, you know? Yeah. And so sort of going back to like what our usual routine is. Um, so normally I'll have the flash, which I'm about to, I'll bring out in just a second. Yeah. Um, I'll normally have that in my backpack, um, just because it doesn't like to stay on the camera very well. Um, so this is sort of what I'm carrying with me when we're out on the rocks. I have this with a strap attached to this little, um, eye bolt here. Yeah. Um, and that's, sort of attached to over my chest. Yeah. So I'm just hanging on to this, you're fishing. Yeah. Then when you catch a fish, mm -hmm. the first thing I'm doing is I pick this up, pull off the lens cap, turn on the camera, because it has the controls to be able to do that. And then I'm turning on the light. And so then this is sort of how I'm filming when he's reeling in the fish. Yeah. Um, and so this allows me like 
good versatility in terms of like if I need to be sort of in the water with you or sort of be able to do that since this is in two bags like we had been using it with one bag and it had been leaking and that's sort of how the light broke a little bit yeah um, which we're gonna probably end up having to buy another light too. yeah um, but now it's in two bags and that's been holding up really well so far yeah uh, but something like this I can bring this underwater like I could probably go a few feet down underwater and that it would be completely fine um, yeah. and completely like dry and ready to go. And that's how we're getting a lot of those shots where you're like at water level with me holding the fish in the water. And then you get the questions that are like, why are you going in the water with the fish? And that's because like for the 40 pound bass, I never took it out of the water. I never put it on my boga grip. I never pulled or like put it on my boga grip and lifted it up. I kept that fish under the water the whole time. Mm -hmm. I only had held it up a little bit for some picks mm -hmm. and then it went right back under the water. You know, yeah. and then when we released it, we swam out with the fish. We yeah. made sure it went. I tried to hit its tail once to get it to kick off. It didn't really kick off. I grabbed its tail again. We kept reviving it. I was figurating it in the water, and then it bit down on my thumb, shook really hard, almost broke my finger, and then I and then it was out of there. You know, he, yeah. it was gone. And then um, so we can go into the into the flash. So I have yeah, I have two flashes here because we broke one of them. Um, so this one was in a plastic bag and it fell into the water. So we were in the water with a pretty big fish. I think this is well over 40 inches. Yeah, this was a 45 inch bass. Yeah. We were out, we swam out to an to a rock, to yeah. boulders that were further out, and we swam out there and we eeled that. Yeah, and, and uh, so I had this in a plastic bag, yeah. and it was up in my backpack, and so I got it out when he caught the fish. Yeah. I like ran up to my backpack, grabbed this, threw it on, um, and then like took my pictures, then I took off the flash so that I could film underwater with this because I'm not really comfortable bringing um, the flash underwater in just a plastic bag. Yeah. Um, so I put that up on the rock, but I didn't realize that that rock was being swept over by waves. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was starting to film the release footage and then Finn's plug bag had broken. And, yeah. And so we had put that up on the rock too. And all of a sudden I feel the plug bag on the back of my feet, on the back of my, my um, calves. And I'm like, oh no. Yeah. And so I look up and this was just washing off the, or this one, I guess, since that was the one that broke, was washing off the rock. Um, so I had like ran and grabbed it and moved everything higher up. Yeah. Uh, but it's just sort of the perils that like it comes with what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just tough to do what we're, it's not like, there's a reason why nobody's done what we've done. Yeah. And it's because you break so much stuff when yeah. you're filming. It's just, it's how it's going to work. Uh, and I don't think people are willing to do that. That's what I was saying. I've been saying for a while. I was like, I don't think there's any other film out there that's showing what real hardcore surf casting is. Mm -hmm. Number one, because the people that are surf casting are that hardcore at doing it. Don't want to have somebody turn on the sun yeah. in the middle of the night. Uh, and two, that... Um, you know, most filmmakers don't want to go through that amount of... You Look at his legs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can see yeah. this man's legs, but they're cheese grater yeah. on the rocks. Yeah. And uh, that's the other thing, you know, like, it's like, it's it's intense. It's a full contact sport, and it's not easy on your camera equipment. You're falling with it. Yeah. You're, there's, he was filming me the other night. The 40-inch bass fell down with his camera equipment. <laughs> yeah. I lost that thing, too, which is yeah. sad. Yeah. But, but whatever. Yeah, and so sort of continuing on, if you look at this, it's sort of an L shape, and the bottom of this um, is the like receiver for the remote trigger. So I can stick this onto just sort of a, a cold shoe mount that I, I ended up sort of screwing this like metal L bracket onto the side of this. Um, so now the flash is up here, and if you remember that little piece of equipment that I stuck, the little um, trigger that I stuck inside the housing, that will communicate with this. So then um, when I'm in photo mode and it's dark enough, which I can be right here, so then if I'm taking a picture, um, <laughs> which of course it's it's not wanting to do because of the, the autofocus, but yeah. yeah. So even though the camera is inside the housing, um, it still can communicate with a flash to take the picture. So that's been like once we figured that out, it really sort of changed the game for us because yeah. it means that I can be in the water with Finn and get those really cool pictures that otherwise we just wouldn't be able to get because yeah. I don't want to ruin my gear. Yeah. Um, and, and there's not a lot of people out there that even get the photos that I've, that you, you've been getting with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just a great camera. Yeah. And it like I sort of have mainly got into video was sort of my 
the starting point for me, but photos, it, a lot of the same concepts apply. A lot of the same stuff is, is it's a similar thing, obviously, because you're still using a camera and yeah. the video is just a bunch of photos in a row. Yeah. Um, <laughs> technically. And, uh, so it, it's sort of the camera works really well for photos and that's sort of what we've been doing. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not it's not foolproof. Every single like s like setup that you could come up with is going to have some kind of fault to it, mm -hmm. uh, and we ran into that the other night um, where my remote trigger that I have inside the housing, uh, because I took it apart, it was um, connected to the hot shoe with two wires, and one of them came on like came detached, which meant that it wasn't communicating with the flash, and so I had to pull the camera out of the housing which meant I couldn't be written in the water and then it was fogging up because it wasn't ready for the humidity yeah. and the flash was acting up and, and the GoPro broke yeah it was it was really not not a good like, time for us and we were th I was talking to him I was like out of all the camera equipment that we have and that we use yeah the GoPro was gonna it was the last thing that I thought we could break yeah and it got water in it yeah and it was like in the front <laughs> LCD screen. Like it's a pretty like to be fair, it's it's not like the newest model of GoPro. This is like a Hero Five, I Something think. Something like that. Which is like several years old at this point. I think they're on the eight at yeah. this point. Um, so it is. It's not the newest camera of all time. Yeah. Um, but it got water behind the like front LCD screen. But still. Um, which it really shouldn't happen because it's built for dealing with more harsh conditions than we're doing. Like at the most, it's underwater for like a couple minutes. Yeah. But people use them like scuba diving and surfing and stuff. Yeah. So so that shouldn't be our problem. And you know, I yeah. I yeah. mean, that's the thing. It shouldn't happen. Yeah. But it's funny because it just shows you how there's just not a lot of stuff built for what we're doing. Oh yeah, and it's sort of it's an interesting thing to try to figure out. And I spent a while trying to think about like how I was gonna get the camera to communicate with the flash, and there are a bunch of different ways of doing it. Um, but this ended up being the like most efficient way um, that I could think of. Uh, so that's sort of what we ended up doing, and, yeah. and it's been working really well so far. Like we've got some really really cool shots. And as far as like underwater housing camera wise mm -hmm. goes, I mean we are. I would say it's for camera gear. We're balling on a budget with this stuff. <laughs> I mean. Sort of like there is, as with fishing, there's there is definitely a an upfront cost to everything. Yeah. Um, and I feel like so we've we've found I think the best value for money. Yeah, that we that's can, what I would say. That that's we can find. So like it. in terms of like underwater housings, again, very specialized equipment. Not many people are using them. Yeah. So they're more expensive, and that's just sort of a fact of life. Yeah. Um, and it's been sort of lucky that we're in the time period now where there's so many. Um, so many consumer camera products that are sold at much lower price points than they otherwise would be. Uh, and that hasn't really reached the underwater footage and the, like that kind of realm yet. So yeah. pretty much most of the gear is sort of not anything that you're going to be able to get, um, for cheap. Like most underwater housings are like well over a thousand dollars. Um, combined cost with like the lens port and the housing and the whole yeah. thing. Um, but this one's like about half that price. Um, and I think it like shipped all the way from Hong Kong. It did. Um, in the middle of Corona. Yeah. Like <laughs> and, at the height of it. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is made by sea frogs. Um, and it, they do a good job. Like it's a very solid case and I would, I would trust it with it. Like what we're doing, especially. Um, but I wouldn't trust it diving. Yeah. But also there's a lot of stuff that, um, that I sort of had to work around. Uh, like you don't have access to all of the dials and buttons and you obviously don't have access to the touch screen. Um, so I had to sort of remap different settings to like different um, like scroll wheels that I wouldn't normally have them attached to. Yeah. Um, just so that I could access them while it's in the housing. Mm -hmm. And and that was something that was also sort of a key for me that I didn't have to like go through the, met, the settings menus with um, just with these buttons, which is a little bit cumbersome, especially when he's like reeling in a big fish and I have to like adjust the settings and everything. Yeah. Um, and there've been times that I've had to like open up the housing and like change a camera setting and then close it. Yeah. Um, like when we, when you caught that big fish during the day, um, on top water, yeah. I, we didn't have a microphone cause the GoPro was dead and I yeah. had to pull it out of the housing and yeah. just try to use the on camera mic. Hey, so that, I mean, you're, you're going to see that on the film too. I mean, yeah, we had one day where we, we just destroyed bun a bunch 
a f- big fish on top water. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the thing, like we have a lot of really awesome stuff. I mean, these were not huge by any means, but they're all over 40 inches. Yeah. Uh, and we have some like like larger ones. Like yeah, I mean, we had a 30 pounder that day, so. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in there that. I'm like so excited, like, cause after this is done, we're gonna start editing the big fish episodes. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so excited to edit those episodes because it's reliving what already happened. So that's the thing, like, I, I think that it's so cool what we're doing, not for you guys, but for me personally, <laughs> yeah. it's so awesome to be able to relive what I did. Um, yeah. And uh, it kind of just, in the winter time, it's gonna be an awesome thing to look back to and be like, you know, it happened again. Yeah. And that was my biggest worry throughout the entirety of the season. You know, can I repeat my season of last year and I'm doing better than I did last season? Mm-hmm. And well, I mean, if you also if you look at sort of um, like what we've done so far in terms of the show, yeah. it's really nothing compared to what we're about to, to do. do. Yeah. Because so like the first episode obviously didn't catch anything except for those tiny little fish at the end. Yeah. And that was just because it's the springtime and we yeah. were trying to give sort of an honest look at like how much time you were putting in to try to catch that first like schoolie of the year. Yeah. Um, and then second episode, we sort of picked it up a little bit. We had some footage of the bigger fish, but nothing crazy. Yeah. Um, and then third episode, we had all this estuary footage that was really cool and sort of a cool storyline that we wanted to present. Yeah. Um, and so I edited that, and I think I, I did as much as I could with what we had. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, and I think turned out pretty well as far as like oh, watchability. Sure. Um, and like he doesn't catch anything big, but it's it's still a cool thing to watch. Yeah. People that were shots. like non fishermen thought that it was the best episode. F- video quality yeah. and like edited wise and it was funny because I was almost where I was like ah that could be a scrapped episode do you know because yeah. it was in between moon phases it was early spring and you guys are going to be watching it in that height of the season so yeah. if you kind of have to t- think back to like okay this is May June you yeah. know early May June time frame me learning a er- new area uh, that's what you kind of have to think back to during that episode but What's going to happen now is the next three episodes, even maybe four or five episodes, yeah. are going to be all 40-plus inch bass. Yeah. Well, and you look at, like, so what I have been doing all this morning has been basically just taking all the footage of fish that are, like, over 40 inches and putting them in a timeline. Yeah. And I have over two hours of just fighting, talking about, and releasing the fish. Yeah. Of Bass over 40 inches. Yeah. All these bass are over 40 inches up to 48 inches. And yeah, and that's so, so just raw footage is like up to, is two hours. Yeah. Which is insane because I had, I think, like probably, I think I had under an hour and a half of like total footage for the estuary episode. So you had like, like an hour and 20 minutes or something? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It was, it was something like that. Footage. So yeah. it was really. I was really not working with a lot in that situation. And this one, it's like I have a, I have a ton of footage to work with. Yeah. And we have a ton of bass that are also aren't over 40 inches. Yeah. That I don't know what we're going to do with And that's the tough thing. And maybe they'll end up being bonus episodes yeah. and or yeah. extra mess around footage, you yeah. know, of, you know, that I'll just edit on my own at yeah. some point in the winter and just put it out as just free content for yeah. you guys. But uh, other than that, I mean, that stuff is... Because we have a lot of, like, 30, 28, 28-inch to 30-inch bass. That it's just, like, you know, it's cool to catch a 30-inch bass, but it's, like, mm-hmm. for what we're doing right now, it's, like, if it's it's pretty much 35 or bust, in yeah. my opinion. Like, yeah. from and, like, what we're trying to get on been, film. We've been catching, like, smaller fish and not even turning on the camera. Yeah. Like, because like, when Finn hooks a fish, I'll like, ask if it's big and he'll tell me. And if it's not, then we just don't turn on the camera. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like we probably, and that's gone up to what now? 30 inch bass to me is like not big enough for us to turn on our camera. Yeah. Cause that's what we've been doing now. Like we're not turning on cameras for 30 inch bass. And then we have like, then even that, like the, even the 40 inch bass I hooked yesterday, mm-hmm. I hooked into him. Kind of was, or no, was it this? I don't know which one it was. One of the I fish, remember. I was not sure. I was like, ah, it's, I guess it's small. And then it woke up and started screaming, dragged. I'm like, yeah, this is a big fish. Yeah. So, um, there, yeah, there's yeah. a, we have just a lot of content to work through. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to sort of see how people react to it as it starts to. And we have better the music bigger. now. That's, that's also true. That was something that we really sort of put some time into was, was trying to find, because for the first, 
uh, two episodes, it was the music service we were using, because this is a whole other thing that doesn't get talked about a lot, is just the difficulty of finding music that you can use on YouTube um, that's not going to get like copyright claimed. It's um, not used in every that's, video. That's not used in like every person ever's video. Yeah. And that like is good music. Yeah. So finding like things that y- you can get most of those like those factors, but it's really hard to get all of them. Yeah. Um, and our first, we found a music service that we started using um, that you like, you pay for it, but you get um, a license for the music so you don't have to deal with copyright issues and, yeah. and everything like that. But it's not like a ridiculous amount of money. No. We're not it's, paying like a lot. Yeah. It's yeah. not that bad. And um, But we paid for it for like two, three months. Yeah. Um, we just scoured their library and we realized, we came to a point where we're like, this isn't really any better than the YouTube free music library yeah. and we're paying like 15 bucks a month for it. Yeah. So it just wasn't worth it. So we just went on a, it. we went on a quest. We, yeah, we did. <laughs> to find a better music service. Um, and we ended up going with a service called uh, music vine, um, which they do a good job. They, I think they license individual songs, but you can also get a plan that you can sort of, um, license like an unlimited number. Um, and it turned out to be, I think, less expensive than the other one for like a whole year. year but you yeah. could only pay for it. You couldn't pay for it monthly. Yeah, so. you had to pay. So we paid for a whole year worth it. But it's paying off in oh, a big yeah. way. And okay. it's, you know, it's music that you'd see. Like, it's good music. Yeah. I've heard lots of that music in, like, TV shows and in movies. Like, it's pretty well used yeah. music. But well, it's also, like... That's the quality that it is that big movies and TV shows are yeah. using it. Well, and I described it to him when I was first sort of looking for them that it's like holding something plastic versus holding something made of metal. Yeah, it's like you can f- like feel the quality of it, and like even if you just sort of of like to how it, the quality of the music is. Yeah, you should be exactly. saying. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it doesn't feel like cheap, just cranked out crappy music. Yeah, it feels like actually something that somebody put time into, yeah, and that sure. actually helps you lead them. Like, cause that's the other thing. Like, you have to like enhance the mood of the the thing that's going on in the video. Yeah, and um, which is difficult to do. But if you find the right music, and I'm sure you guys all know of you, these any videos really out there that they have the right music at the right time, you're like, wow, that's really cool because the music just felt really cool with that thing. Yeah. And like you, if you yeah. listen to it critically, you'll be able to hear the difference in quality between the music in episode two and the music in episode three. Yeah. Um, and like, I mean, we found, we did we, Again, we, we found scoured. Good. We so found, we found like, okay. Yeah. But here's the thing. Like we would have taken any song on this music vine place yeah. If we heard it like on the other one that we yeah. were using, and this is—I <laughs> don't think we really need to say this. But this isn't like sponsored by them or anything. No, like, we're, yeah, we're yeah, definitely not we sponsored wish. by them. Yeah, <laughs> but, but legitimately, it, yeah. it's, it's a lot better quality, and I think that that's really going to sort of reflect on. This is not me raving about Stormer again, yeah. and then actually dropping it at the end of the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, but still, I think they if like even if you think about like. Um, like sort of what what we're trying to do, like even for me when I'm editing, yeah. having music that sort of creates that like mind frame for me about like what I'm sort of going for, the mood I'm going for, the sort of pacing I'm going for, that really helps me a lot to sort of have that. And it might be just because that's sort of how I started out editing. Like I would always have my music first and edit like to the music yeah. versus editing first and then adding the music afterwards. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different way of thinking and a very different way of editing. And sort of try having to generate that pacing and like the good storyline on your own is a lot more difficult um, than having music there. So it's a huge help to have really cool music that I'm editing to, and that sort of like gets me hyped and gets my brain in the right place for what, yeah. what I'm doing. And that's really and that's important for you as you know watching the video. Yeah, that's super. It's it's if you can get into that same mind frame where it gets you hyped about watching it, um, yeah. then we've done our jobs. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. How I long think that's we've been probably. I don't know. We've definitely been going for the allotted amount of time. Yeah, we've been going for a good amount of time. So yeah, I guess we'll we'll end it there. Yeah. So, so thank it, you guys for you know listening and watching yeah, this podcast. And again, everything that we've talked about is in the description. Um, mm-hmm. So if you want to take a look at what we like as far as camera gear, it's all there. Yeah, and just you know, uh, yeah. 
uh, that it helps us out too if you get it through the links. So just if you want to help support what we're doing yep. and you want any of the equipment, just go follow the Amazon links. Uh, and thank you guys so much for uh, watching this podcast. Uh, and I'll see you next time.